So hello, everybody, and welcome to um, this um, yeah, to this Zoom conversation, the Zoom webinar. Um, and uh, thanks for jumping on so quickly. I know we kind of threw it at people um, only in the last week. Um, and so the fact that we've had as many people kind of interested in showing up um, is really exciting. And obviously, we're recording it. So uh, we hope to be able to share it a little bit more um, broadly. Uh, after the conversation is over. Um, so my name is Stacy Mann. Um, I am an interpretive planner based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm going to let the other people that are kind of on this call right now introduce themselves. Um, and then I'll help to kind of ground the conversation really quickly. And then Matt's going to help to facilitate a conversation with um, these lovely, these lovely folks from the Anacostia <clears throat> Museum, excuse me. Um, so Matt, why don't you go ahead? Good afternoon, everybody. Matt Kirkman here. I'm also an interpretive planner, uh, exhibition planner and, and designer uh, calling in from Salem, Massachusetts today. And I will pass it to Melanie. Great. Good afternoon. I'm Melanie Adams. I am the director of the Smithsonian's Anacostia Community Museum, and I will toss it to Andrea Jones. That's right. Here I am. Um, Andrea, uh, I'm the Associate Director of Education, um, and next will be Miriam. Hello, I'm Miriam Duccio. I am the Collections Manager at the museum, the Anacostia Community Museum. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the clarification. Um, so I'm just going to do this quickly. Um, just to help kind of ground this, this conversation for folks. Um, so the conversation that we're having today is about reinventing the legacy of community engagement. And obviously we've kind of set the stage that this is with Anacostia Community Museum. Um, and um, this conversation actually came about um, and grew out of a series of conversations that were happening just very informally in the spring. Um, Paul, uh, Paul Arcelli and Kathy McLean had a couple of conversations in the spring where they were talking about community engagement and innovation and experimentation and, um, and thinking about some of the, some of the incredible work that was done in the eighties and the nineties and how some of that work has fallen off and asking questions about, you know, why that was happening and why aren't we seeing more kind of progressive or interesting models um, being experimented with um, and what are some of the hurdles to that. And then the conversation expanded to then include Matt and myself and Barbara Henry. And we basically um, started to think about who was out there is doing really great work that we think uh, we could shine a light on and, and really engage in conversation to get a feel for how they came about, like how they came up with the models that they're using, um, what some of the challenges and the benefits have been to the work that they're doing, um, and just how can we start to think about this work a little bit uh, differently to encourage more people to to get out there and be connected with their communities um, and be thinking differently about how we actually build exhibits and how we do storytelling. Um, so with that in mind, um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the history and the legacy of community centered practice at the Anacostia Community Museum. Um, we're going to be talking as well about a couple of projects that they ran during the pandemic, specifically Men of Change and Food for the People, um, that were both just incredibly, um, incredibly moving and engaging and really impressive um, examples of how you can remain active. Um, within your community and, and, you know, as a museum kind of outside of the walls of a specific gallery and really start to take your narrative outside the walls of the museum. Um, they also have a really exciting new community collecting initiative that they've launched that we're gonna hear a little bit about. Um, and then we also wanna kind of talk about this idea of transformative change and experimentation and innovation and, and leadership and how, how do we start to crack that nut around leadership and making sure that when change is initiated, that it 
embeds itself, you know, enough within the culture that it can outlast kind of, you know, any single person or any single department, um, you know, when there's that inevitable, um, that inevitable change in leadership. Um, so with that, I want to encourage people to share in the chat or use the Q&A um, if there's anything that kind of sparks for you um, and you have questions that you want to ask, because we'll definitely try to fold those into the conversation as well. Um, and with that, I'm gonna say, let's let's get to it. Great, thank you. Well, I'm about to share my screen. So you'll uh, see some nice visuals as we're talking about um, the Anacostia Community Museum. And this is a really timely um, opportunity to really have this conversation. Um, before this panel, I was actually meeting with the daughter of Louise Hutchinson, who was one of our original staff members. Um, so she, were, she was one of John Kennard's um, first hires. So I feel like um, that legacy continues on. She was talking about um, the museum and what it meant to her as a child and what it meant to her mother. Um, so the Anacostia Community Museum was founded back in 1967 um, out of a very similar time to what's happening now. So if you think about, um, kind of the racial unrest um, that was, that's been happening in the country over the last couple of years, this was the same type of time period that the Anacostia Community Museum was founded upon. Um, we were founded by then Secretary Dylan Ripley, um, who did a lot of the expansion of the Smithsonian. And he thought it was really important to put a museum um, in an African-American community. Um, so as you can see, we've always been kind of a jack of all trades, meaning we're science, we're history, we're art. Um, we had live animals at some point, as you look at the sign behind um, John Kennard. Um, but really, John Kennard is given the credit, rightly so, for that community-based museum, because he was not just going to have exhibits from natural history or exhibits from American history come to our, come to the east side of the river, he really wanted to make sure we were telling stories and doing exhibits that resonated with the community. Um, and that really is the foundation um, of a community-based museum. Um, so one of the exhibits that we are just always will be known for is the rat, Man's Invited Affliction, um, which actually had live rats. And there have been numerous stories on how we got the rats, so that I don't know. But, um, but this is a great example of a situation that was happening um, in Ward 8 Southeast where the museum is located and doing an exhibit around what the people knew and understood. Um, so this, is, this has really carried on um, throughout um, our time in Anacostia. So since that time, um, we've actually moved. So our first museum was an old movie theater down on Nichols Avenue, which is now Martin Luther King um, Boulevard. But we moved just really one mile up the road on um, Morris Avenue. And this is our new building. Um, similar to our colleagues um, across the river, we also sit on National Park Service land. And this was the former National Park Service building. Um, so what you're looking at now, um, as Stacy alluded to, um, like many other museums around the country, um, March 20th hit and everyone shut their doors. Um, so ACM was like every other museum, we shut our doors, we figured out how to use Teams and Zoom and then kind of came back up um, and really tried to figure out what did we need to do to continue to serve the community. Um, and this exhibit, Food, um, Food for the People, Eating and Activism in Greater Washington, this was always planned. So I don't want you to think we started planning this on March 20th um, when the pandemic hit. This exhibit had already been planned. It had just been planned for indoors only. And so what we did with this was we actually figured out, okay, we're still closed. And we wanted to find a way to share this content because it was very relevant to what was going on, um, not only in um, the Southeast community, but around the country, around issues related to food insecurity. Um, so as our curator, um, Samir Magelli would probably tell you, instead of one exhibit, he had to do two. Because <laughs> um, this outside exhibit really was an exhibit um, that could stand alone. And so as you can see, we worked with some really talented designers 
who really helped us imagine how could we create a COVID safe experience while also telling these stories of um, food justice and injustice um, in the DC region. Um, one of the components of this is a monument to essential workers, because again, we felt it was really important that a lot of the people who were keeping us fed during this time had to go to work. And so this is um, a monument where we asked people to write thank yous and to appreciate um, the work of essential um, food workers at that time. And you'll see even this card from someone from Columbia, South Carolina, as an essential worker delivering food gives me a sense of purpose, proud to serve you. And so this is just one example of the types of um, responses we're still getting um, to this monument. So before we decided to actually move out onto our plaza, I think we did what a lot of organizations or museums specifically did was start providing virtual programs. Um, and so our first foray into the virtual sphere really was um, a program we created called Moments of Resilience. And what we asked people to do all over the world, like we weren't limiting it to any geography, was tell us how you were being resilient in this moment. And we felt that really spoke to the work of Anacostia in terms of the resilience of communities. And so we got wonderful responses from people um, all over the country about how they were being resilient during this moment. Um, everything from you know, meeting your neighbors because now you're walking around the neighborhoods more to picking up old um, hobbies and things that you maybe had put aside but now have time. So moments of resilience have really allowed us to both collect, which was important, but more importantly, share um, these stories on our website. The other program we implemented was Take Time Thursdays. And the reason why I think this one is unique um, is because it wasn't just pushing out our museum content. I don't know how much of this actually had our museum content. More of it was things that were interesting to the community. So it was everything from a musical performance, to yoga, to cooking performances. So it was, it was things that people wanted um, right there in the moment. Um, and finally, the other thing I'll talk about quickly when we talk about serving our community is this is a program that we partnered with um, called Feed the Fridge, where this refrigerator actually sits on our parking lot and we provide a um, hundred free meals a day to anyone who just walks up and grabs a meal. They're pre-prepared. Um, and we have been one of the most um, popular sites out of all their sites um, in the region. And again, this is a way for us to serve our community when we were both closed and we continue to have it now that we're open as well. Oh, sorry, one more. Um, I'm gonna let Andrea explain this one since she created it. <laughs> uh Okay, this is a this is an interactive in the inside part of food for the people. Um, you know, we have a lot of issues. We ha we display a lot of issues and a lot of problems um, in the food system, but at the end, we wanted to give people a chance to um, have some hope and to know that everybody has a part in um, solving the problem. So, <clears throat> this is a um, actually an interactive that I. Um, stole from <laughs> from C Cooper Hewitt. Um, I mean, I guess if design thinking is is stealing, but design it, this employs design thinking, um, where you and there's a series of question cards. You can choose one of the questions, which is like an issue, like um, how do we get um, f increase food access in low income neighborhoods, for example. Um, and then on the back, there's tactic cards. Uh, tactics that you can use to kind of scaffold your, um, you know, your idea process, which really seems to be working because people are really fill, filling these out you know, and they're sitting down and, and writing a lot. Um, I don't know, like, I'm actually not sure how this relates to community engagement, but we put it in there. <laughs> well, this, I think the reason why, one of the things I really like about this activity, which this is an after effect, we didn't plan for this, so that role you see are values. So as a visitor, you select your value and you use that value to answer the question. And then um, we ask them to stick their values on this like poster board we have up. And what that has really allowed us to do is to look at the values of the people that are coming into our mm -hmm. museum. So I think that's where it fits into the community is it gives us a better picture of who's coming to visit us. 
So next up is men of change and just let me know when you need to change the slide. Okay, great. Um, I also wanted to like um, point back at the Take Time Thursday um, program because it's really amazing. People, I've presented on this before and people are saying, like, is this mission related? Like how to how to grow house plants, you know? And <laughs> it, it really wasn't, it was very much about um, meeting people's emotional, like people just did not want heavy content in the early pandemic. We all just wanted to, a chance to not talk about things that were in our head and stop doom scrolling, right? And so I think meeting people's emotional needs is, is you know, something that I would consider really essential in a, in a crisis like we had. Um, so Men of Change is, um, was, happened right as I was starting this job. So I've been here about a year and I was looking back at my text messages and um, it was like two days after I'd started. And uh, I remember Melanie texting me and saying, hey, we, um, we rented Men of Change from the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service known as Sites. It's supposed to be installed in December. I don't think we're gonna open by December, um, you know, but it costs a lot to store the boxes and, you know, there's all this stuff. Um, like, what should we do? And like, we talked about it and we thought, well, what if we like brought it outside? And we started thinking through, well, you know, it's not really great for, you know, our particular, um, for our, for the uh, National Park Service land would be very complicated to install. Um, plus we don't get a lot of foot traffic. So what if we found a neighborhood to install it? So um, we, we found this little two block area in what is known as Deanwood, a little neighborhood in Ward 7 in DC, um, which is kind of uh, another one of the east of the river neighborhoods that gets uh, ignored usually when it comes to um, you know cultural uh, focal points. So we we basically took all the graphics that were in this exhibit and had them kind of like resized and remade and put up on the scaffolding. And this is an example of that. Um, this is a throughway. So this is like a cut through um, that where people go from going to um, their houses to the metro. So this saw a lot of traffic right here and this is during and you can see I put a night picture up here because it, it really meant that our museum was open 24 hours which I thought was kind of cool about this okay you can go next slide this was just on the map of we put we installed this exhibit around two different blocks um so that ex where you see two three four five that was that cut through area um but we also had it installed up at um the upper part number six is the library. Um, number seven and eight is the Deanwood Community Center. Um, and then number one, which is really why I was attracted to this neighborhood is the Ron, Ron Brown High School, which is a high school in particular for um, boys, African-American boys. So men of change is about African-American men of change who have you know, either in historical times or current day, are pushing the boundaries, uh, you know, challenging stereotypes, um, myth breaking. Um, okay, you can change the slide. It's not letting me change. Let's see what happens. It's stuck, huh? It is stuck, but keep talking. I will make it not stuck. Okay, so. Oh, there we go. Oh, here we go. There's Ron Brown High School. So the exhibition had seven different themes in it. And it just so happened that this two block area, there were, there were them thematic areas that just fit the places. And it became this um, like where co the context of the place was kind of really in dialogue with uh, the uh, exhibition elements. So like this part was put up, it was called Myth Breakers. The theme was Myth Breakers. And there's um, a high school full of uh, myth-breaking kids. Um, they had this whole program of restorative justice. Um, it was just a really good, really good fit. And you can go to the next slide and show I think the library. So the library, we installed the thematic area storytelling. So these are all different 
types of storytelling, but you know, really perfect for the library. Next. Um, this is the section that we added. So this was not a part of the original sites exhibition. This is, um, we decided to kind of turn the tables and, and think about men of change as um, just people in the community. So these men of change that were in the exhibit, we wanted to say, look, this is, these people are famous, but you don't have to be famous to, um, to create change and look at your own neighborhood has all these great um, really, really great role models. So we got together with the Dean Wood Citizens Association um, and the, damn, like now I'm forgetting the names of the places, but uh, it was a community effort. They voted, they came up with um, seven different men who represented the themes in the exhibition. Uh, they wrote the label text and we had our Smithsonian photographer take the, the photos and this was really cool. They had their own reception um, with kind of the unveiling of this. Um, next. So um, because we couldn't have the museum open, uh, it kind of presented a, um, a challenge, right? But I, I think what we ended up doing was um, thinking kind of in the opposite. You know, So if we couldn't have people come to the museum, what are all the different ways that we could get this content out there and bring the content to the people. And, and not just the content, but just the feeling of you know, black pride or um, you know, uh, the, the historical context, the, the messaging that we were there, that we were still thinking of them. Um, so this is a, the projection project that we did where we took images from Men of Change. And we did these nighttime projections all over uh, Ward 8 on different uh, weeks. Okay, next. We took the, um, the films, there were actual films that went with the exhibition, I think uh, five different short films. And uh, instead, of, so we couldn't actually show them ne next to the exhibit. So we showed them at a drive-in movie night um, at Union Market, which is this kind of like hip, um, like, uh, gourmet food court sort of place. Um, and that was that was really fun. Okay, next. And the, I guess one of the last ways we kind of reached out was um, to the incarcerated population of the DC jail. So the DC jail, the folks that were in jail were actually um, required to stay there quarantined in their cells for 23 hours of the day during uh, most of the pandemic. I mean, like this was like almost a year that this happened. And um, the only kind of, the, their library services were, were cut off. They had, they had a library branch in the jail, but um, they weren't allowed to get books anymore. So one thing that they did institute was a plan to give each person um, a, a tablet that they could read materials, content books. Um, and so when, we found out about this through the library. Our partner was the library. Um, we thought, well, could we get men of change onto tablets? Um, so we created kind of like a like a, a video tour of the exhibit. And you know, a lot of the guys in the jail were from Deanwood. I mean, this was like their old stomping ground. So kind of like leading them through the neighborhood um, and showing them. Here's a there's is a a Howard student, Ron Brown, former Ron Brown student who kind of gave the, the tour and it features community voices. Okay, next. The last one uh, is just a couple of recent projects we did. I guess we can't probably show this. This is a, a video, it's like a reel from Instagram, but I don't think we shared the sound on Zoom. So it probably, yeah. if you hit play, they, people can see the visuals though, I think. Okay. This is a community resource fair that we did recently that um, where we offered vaccinations and job resources. If, yeah, here we go. Ooh, it's playing. It's stuck. Oh, there, yeah. We gave free groceries, um, HIV testing, free books. 
resources for families, jobs, job resources, and dancing, you know, a little dancing. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to point out about that particular program, there was no learning objective, right? So we're the education department. There were no like, hey, let's learn about food for the people or uh, food justice or the history of food justice or um, I mean, people obviously could go into the museum, but this was so just solely about trying to meet people's needs in the moment that, you know, folks who are struggling in our own neighborhood, just in the seven block area around the, around the um, museum. And then this last kind of like, I guess th this was definitely a, a pandemic shift with um, doing kind of a mailing box. And I know a lot of folks have done mailing boxes, but we tried to sort of turn this into um, an experience where you go all around the city and explore new places through the eyes of celebrity chef Carla Hall. Um, and I mean, I, I'll tell you more about it if you want to know, but the idea is basically to get people, this is another way of meeting people where they are going to them, letting them self guide, you know, a lot of people still are not comfortable coming into the museum. So could we turn the city into the museum, right? And, and have people explore new places in the city, um, you, you know, with audio, with, um, with some fun challenges, puzzles, and, and swag. All right. Oh, it's Miriam's turn. <laughs> so speaking of the city, actually, um, in the collections department, we launched this past year a um, co collecting project around foodways and specifically Asian Pacific American foodways. So looking at um, the ways that Asian Pacific American communities participate in um, creating the food landscape that we all participate in. And then also looking um, kind of inward at documenting personal food practices and experiences and thoughts and traditions um, within the household and within more private spaces. So the project um, kind of developed, it launched in fall 2020 um, and we hired a wonderful uh, or contracted a, a wonderful um, uh, uh, researcher and coordinator um, from the Korean American community, Kevin Kim, who um, has been kind of shepherding the project uh, throughout. And um, this basically uh, was, the intention was to, um, document broadly uh, this, this diversity of, of um, food waste in the region. Um, and we wanted the project to really involve the community and really be interactive, um, seeking input from the community, having them shape the project, shape what gets collected, what, what defines um, you know, the, those, the, the food ways. Um, and involving also some community members in discussions and decision making about the project. And so you can see some of the um, aspects that have been documented through the project. It's covered a wide range of um, places um, in terms of um, kind of professionals involved in food ways. Uh, there's been a, a, a focus on restaurants, on um, takeouts, on uh, carryouts. Um, on uh, everything from catering services to uh, actually one recent interview was with somebody who's starting a business for meal kits, Korean uh, meal kits um, that, that people can you know, take home and cook their own Korean meal and learn something that way. Um, we've also looked at supermarkets, um, both mainstream and ethnic markets. We've looked at corner stores and how those um, many um, DC corner stores uh, have been often owned by Korean American um, people uh, in the past. And that's changing a little bit in the present. So there, but we've conducted interviews with um, owners of uh, corner stores. Um, we've looked at farms also, food production and um, local farms. Uh, we've worked with artists, 
uh, who, whose art connects with food ways in a variety of ways with cookbook authors and so forth. So there have been, um, it's been really um, kind of a, a, a wide ranging project in that sense. Next slide. Um, and the core team, um, oh, actually, and we put out calls also to the community, both in the newspaper and on neighborhood listserv. Um, to have uh, community members just kind of broadly speaking throughout the region uh, send suggestions of places that they thought we should document and, um, you know, look at uh, archiving in, in the collection as part of this project. Next slide. So the, the so next, yeah, the next slide, is it? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so the core team is um, is this this group of uh, six community curators and uh, myself, and um, we met every two weeks on Zoom. Uh, and I have to say, in that sense, the pandemic, I think, helped with the frequency of meetings. It just everybody was equipped to be able to easily touch base um, on a on a more regular basis than might have been possible otherwise, um, since many of these um, traders have other jobs and um, responsibilities. Um, but they really got into the project in a wonderful way and uh, really participated in actually shaping all of it. So they in particular were instrumental in self-documenting. Um, and actually this is a tradition, I, I think at the museum, at Anacostia Community Museum has long it has a history of working with local groups and kind of teaching local groups how to document their own history. Um, and and um, in particular, in the past, the, the museum had had projects working with church groups, for example, to um, kind of teach archival practices and, you know, to ensure that those records are kept and saved and um, so forth. So in this case, of course, we were focused on food ways and documenting food. And um, we had in mind that each of the community curators would reach out to five um, family members or friends or people within their orbit and their, their community and work with them to document what they thought about food and what that looked like for them. Um, within that framework, we then had ongoing discussions and some of the things that emerged um, through those discussions were, for example, a desire to uh, document to, to kind of coordinate to request that all of the participants provide, for example, a photograph of their pantry or groceries. So the unprepared food. So that's that's one thing that everybody kind of agreed. You know, we, sh we would be kind of nice to have um, represented. We also asked people to document at least one meal. Uh, and one instance of cooking. And then the rest was really quite open and people came up with very, just a whole range of really incredible um, photographs and then uh, discussed their choices in an interview, an oral history conducted by the community curator. So we offered training for all of this, um, training in conducting oral histories um, training in documenting what gets collected, in cataloging practices, in um, writing captions, actually, uh, and, you know, trying to make captions both informative and engaging um, is an art. Uh, and um, so we've ended up with a really kind of nice um, compilation of materials as a result of uh, the project. And I, I have a few examples in the next slides, um, just of some of the photographs that came in of meal time um, with one of the community curators and her family actually organized a whole um, meal um, at uh, focused on the lotus plant. Actually, she made, she cooked an entire six course meal, I think, entirely <laughs> from um, lotus plants. And they went and picnic outdoors by the lotus plants um, and, uh, and, and um, 
you know, made a, a, a wonderful meal of it. Um, and others featured family gatherings, etc. The next slide is it shows the pantries, fridges. Uh, some participants actually are are uh, gardeners and um, get quite a bit of produce and herbs and so forth from their garden. Sometimes. Um, uh, ingredients that cannot that they can't find find locally um, in uh, stores. Um, and next slide, we also um, were able to collect some materials. So, for example, we have a um, hot pot that was purchased in Taiwan and brought to the United States with a first generation immigrant, um, the father of one of the um, community curators as well as some um, dishes and trays from the Korean Presbyterian Church in Centerville, Virginia, where meals, that's one of the things we, we discovered actually, and, and then explored um, just the centrality of meals and communal meals to church communities. Um, and so in, in this instance, there's a, every Sunday, there's a, um, a, a big meal uh, of all the uh, community, church community members. Um, and then an example of artwork from a um, comic cookbook author called Cook Korean that has also entered the, collect the collection with her um, kind of uh, sketches for um, the book as well. Um, so it's just been kind of a, a wonderful project. A lot of the feedback that we've received from the community curators um, was just excitement um, about this opportunity to, to kind of participate in creating a record of their um, practices. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's just been a fun project generally. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much. And I want to quickly dive right into some of the questions that have been appearing in the in the chat and um, some in the Q and A and a few of them are, are kind of like laser focused logistical questions. So I'm gonna hit those really, really fast. Um, was it possible or not possible to partner with a grocery store for the Food for the People exhibition? Melanie, do you, did you wanna- look, Did you explore that idea? Um, we did look um, for grocery store partners, but um, we didn't end up having one um, at the end of the day, because also I think a lot of the large grocery stores were ones that are kind of being criticized in the exhibit in a way, because it dealt with where they would locate their stores and such, so it wasn't, wouldn't have been a good connection. Thank you. And then um, it was answered briefly, Andrea, about the evaluation process. Did you want to say more about that, or did you do you feel you covered that in the in the um, chat? Well, it might be interesting to, for folks to know kind of the things that we wanted to know in the evaluation, um, because we and this is a conversation that we had with the evaluator. Um, we were not interested in knowing about what people were learning from the exhibit. I know that sounds. I, I'm saying this again, which makes this sound very you know, un, <laughs> unscholarly, but um, it, I really wanted to know, are people coming to the exhibit that don't normally go to museums? You know, are these what, what they would think of in their identity as a museum person, right? Um, are, you know, I also want to know how the museum affected the, their perception of the neighborhood. Um, how, you know, how is it being affected because their neighborhood was really transformed, you know, the whole, um, not only did they get an exhibit, but all of a sudden things started happening, like, um, like the city started picking up their trash, you know, because the Smithsonian was there. Um, I was asked if we could get them a bike rack. Um, <laughs> I was not able to do that, but you see what I'm saying? It wasn't just about the exhibit and it wasn't just about the content in the exhibit. It was about what this, this exhibit did in this space. So um, I, I'm really looking forward to getting some of those results. One thing we know for sure, um, just from a lot of anecdotal evidence is that people often didn't know about all the parts of the exhibit. And they, you know, they may have like walked by one part a lot and didn't realize there was like a whole thing, which like does not bother me at all. But um, I could see, you know, uh, 
if you were you know putting your exhibit in in a museum and people didn't like if they only saw a small section of it people would be concerned but i think it's a, just a different type of um, application here so um, and then finally before we get on to some um i guess larger questions just um for you specifically uh melanie can you elaborate a little bit on the development of the take time thursday program and how that how that was developed Sure, it really was um, developed exactly how Andrea said in the sense that we knew, we, this was I think an example of programming for ourselves. We know we didn't want heavy content. Um, and you know, at the very early stages of the pandemic, people wanted an escape. Um, so that's why it's a brief 30 minutes in the middle of your day, come watch a puppet show, come hear someone sing. It was very, what I guess museums would consider light and fluffy, but it was exactly what people needed at that time. So mm -hmm. it really was kind of a programming for us in a strange way. I do know that Janelle got a lot of ideas for future Take Time Thursdays from the evaluations that we did after each one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Kathy, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. You had a, a question that you wanted to ask the, the panel. Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for doing to, for telling us about your projects. This to me, this is really authentic community engagement work in a way that I don't see out there in the rest of the museum world very often. So I just want to put that down. I think it'd be really interesting going forward. Melanie, you just said something that kind of really resonated as a maybe this is one of the aspects of it that makes it this important and authentic and it's because you started with what people need not what you wanted to put out there but what people need and i just have a question this is a bigger overarching question that kind of gets more at why we even started these conversations john canard the founding director of the anacostia was a personal hero museum hero of mine and when I was working early on at the Oakland Museum in the 1970s, a lot of the, the Anacostia work directly affected a lot of the work that we were doing there and the projects that we were doing there because of John Kennard's work at the Anacostia Museum. We were you know, directly influenced by that. And I have two kinds of questions for you. Can you describe in looking back at that, looking at what you're doing now, but also acknowledging what happened those many years ago? Can you describe the similarities and differences in the early work at Anacostia and the work you're doing now? And do you think, uh, I, I believe that what you describe now and what Anacostia was doing back in the late 60s and early 70s was so edgy and provocative and too far, so far out that museums today would not, would consider it too edgy to do in their own institutions. So can you just talk a little bit? I just feel like we're getting so much more conservative in our old age, but what you're doing is really resonate. It feels like it came right out of what was happening back then. I mean, I definitely think we've built upon the work of John Kennard and ACM, but I'm always surprised when people think going outside is edgy. Like that just cracks me up. I'm like, it's outside. Like it didn't seem like it was a big jump, even though a lot of people didn't do it. Um, so I think one of the things that continued that we continue to go through is we don't necessarily um, not ask permission. That's not the way to put it, but we think about things in a way that is more community driven and community connected. And we look for various entry points. So I describe it as our audience at ACM is very different than the audience on the mall because the audience on the mall are going to be tourists. Our audience is not tourists. Our audience is the person that lives across the street and what do they need, which is very different than what a tourist needs. So I think we've always kept that um, in mind. And I'm sure Andrea can put in the chat, there is a really problematic video of our, of our founding, but it's great because it actually shows you the images and it talks about us as a community museum back in, I think this video was from 1970, which is why I say it's problematic, but the shots are just great because you really have to see that community focus of the museum. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to add too um, that I, I feel, you know, as just a recent employee, um, a really big responsibility to live up to the history of the museum. 
because I know for not every museum has a, a storied history and, and like a, a really legendary origin story, um, but our museum does. And, you know, feeling like that's who we are and, but it, it continually has to be reinvented. I don't think it just comes naturally. Um, the pandemic presented all kinds of new challenges. Of course, I mean, I think like I hear the word pivot a lot, but really what I think of is respond you know, like respond to what is happening in the moment. Um, like forget about who you think you are. Um, if, if like people need a uh, COVID vaccine, like, could you help with that? Like it's a, it's an actual emergency out here, you know? So how do we do whatever we can with, with what we have to, to get out there and respond. But I will say, I think it's a little, it might be, I don't know what you think about this, Melanie. I think it's a little bit harder for a museum now to do these things than it was before, only because the Smithsonian is just so much more like grandiose. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of red tape to get through when we do these kinds of things. Um, like the Smithsonian is not really set up to be community oriented, right? Um, so I don't know what it was like back then, but like, I know there were stories about, um, they, they did like the second exhibition they did was, um, on Morton prison and they had, uh, incarcerated, um, men coming to the museum and doing performances and things like that. I could not imagine the scale of red tape that we would have to go through to do that. So, I mean, it is a little, it's different. So speaking of the, um, engaging in the now moment. There's a question in the Q&A um, from Margaret. Margaret, would you like to unmute or would you like me to share your question? You out there? Um, I'll, I'll handle it. Margaret asks, uh, one of the ways we can see how abiding our community connections are is noticing how much uh, they partner with us or mention with and connect up with us after projects are over. So. I think you scratched the surface of that, Andrea. Is there anything else to say about connecting um, during projects versus after projects? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I feel like it's a little bit of a small world out here. I mean, it's a big city, DC, but I keep running into the same folks. Like if you don't keep communicating, then you, you, you lose. I mean, you, these things come back around, right? The karma is going to bite you. Um, I, I mean, I think in particular in Ward 8 and Ward 7, we like really do continually talk to other organizations um, and see what they're doing. And it really, you see that things are, it's a, it's a small world out there. I will say actually from the collections perspective, we have sort of the long range timeframe <laughs> in mind. And so we really do see people come back and we, you know, regularly have people um, just get in touch and say, oh, my grandmother's such and such is in your collection, you know, can I see it someday? Or uh, in fact, during the pandemic, we pivoted to um, hosting research appointments online. So uh, our archivist in particular has made material available through Zoom appointments with um, you know, anyone who was requesting access to collections, including she's shown films um, on Zoom and um, various things. So I, I think that's one way in which people really do come back. And that's kind of an interesting also um, legacy of the museum's early days as a non-collecting institution initially, um, where the collection wasn't there to document, you know, to kind of remain as um, after some of the incredible projects that were done early on in the history of the museum. So um, that's just, yeah, one one area where we, do, we really do hear from people who come again and again. Thank you. Um, Barbara, would you like to unmute yourself? You had a, an interesting question about yeah. legacy. Yeah, and thank you. This, this work is, is very inspiring. It seems like you really stay true to the values of the organization um, and really meeting this moment in time that's so historical, we'll never forget. So my question looks at, 
How is an understanding of an institution's exemplary work in the past critical for inspiring innovation? And when is it a hindrance? And I'm thinking particularly if you're looking long-term as new staff come in, whether it's new leadership or other staff, I think hearing that from your different perspectives would be helpful. I think it's actually encouraging that they've done things so outside of the museum norm. Um, and so I think so many times as museum professionals, professionals in general, we self-censor ourselves. Like we tell ourselves no before we even ask the question. And I feel like John Kennard just didn't ask the question. He just did it. And now it's become the norm. Um, so I think it's just exciting to be able to build upon that because this is the type of work we've always done. Um, so that's why I always, you know, question about how monumental is it because it, we're just doing what we've always done as a community-based museum. Um, I think it is a really ever is a hindrance. Do you Go think ahead, it's ever sorry. a hindrance? Well, I, with that, I respond to the idea, uh, let's say when new staff come in and leadership, they may say you're too tied to the past or this is not innovative enough or it's somehow, or what's happening is a transition when staff leave. And I see this in many museums, staff leave. There's no Passover of information or resources to the new staff. So that history then is sort of buried in the understanding, the heart and the values and the innovation of the organization. So sort of, that's sort of like context. So it's what's happening today in these changeovers. I think because we have such a storied history, as Andrea has mentioned, we have articles we can read. So I, you know, when I started, I was reading articles about ACM. We can go to our archives. So I think that's still alive for us, but I think it's throughout the museum field. Everyone says we've always done it that way. So I don't want you to think people don't say that at ACM. They do. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of pushing through that and looking for ways to almost reward creativity and innovation, which I think, you know, a lot of museums may not necessarily do. And so I think that's one of the cultures that we really want to create here at ACM is how it, how are we being creative and innovative and changing and even thinking about being an incubator um, for new ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's exactly what I think about when I design programs is, is like what would be in the spirit of this museum in, in its past, you know? Um, because sometimes it is easy to get a little bit complacent. You know, you do things year after year after year and it's like, you know, questioning what, why are, is this actually really meeting the, the need of the day? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think is a big, a big question. But you know what, we also um, collect on ourselves. I don't know if many museums do this, um, right, Miriam? Like we have a whole section of our collections that is dedicated to who we have been. Right, exhibit record. Right. And, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's definitely, um, I mean, that's been part of my education at <laughs> the museum is just combing through the archives. Mm -hmm. I, think you, I think you just answered one of my questions, which was, what, what is one of the first steps a museum can take to shift its culture to one of risk-taking and unconventional thinking? That's one, that's one very tangible step is to start a self-collection program. That is a tangible, I think that's, a, but you know, a, a mindset too. I think really what all, all of this about is just, is just about empathy. You know, it's like getting outside of yourself, thinking about other people's perspectives, teaching your brain how to do that on a regular basis. You know, it's not just about me. It's not just about this museum. It's about everyone out there. And let's think about what, what are all the ways that people might be experiencing this time? You know, um, because although we all went through it together, we each had such individual experiences. There were people with little kids at home. There were people that were out on the front lines, you know, grocery store workers. There were people that um, were lonely. You know, I mean, thinking about like what people might be experiencing is something that is, um, it's cognitive, it's not necessarily emotional, right? So. Um, you can train yourself to do it. Go ahead. I have, Go ahead. I have one more kind of bigger picture question, and that is, um, 
there are two things that I keep that keep bugging me um, these days, and one of them is that the museum field writ large, most people in the museum field are clueless about um, all of this, this kind of legacy of innovative work, that people are coming up with these things as if this is the first time, and they're not even this really this radical, as radical as what you guys are talking about, um, as uh, um, thinking that these are new innovations. And, and it seems to me that about in the early 1980s or mid 80s, the buzz about the Anacostia Museum kind of fell off. It was like you didn't hear about them so much anymore. And I think that happened at the Oakland Museum. It happened at a lot of different museums. What do you think happened there and how, and, and it, because I think it does tie into today's museum professionals not knowing about this kind of work. I think part of the issue, because when I think of the night, um, you know, 1967, when we were founded and museums like us, they were ethnic based museums. So I think from museums that didn't necessarily get the type of coverage that your larger museums did, that's why right now, small community based museums are like, we've been doing this work for 50 years, welcome. And that's why it's frustrating because people didn't necessarily know about the work because they weren't museums that they would go to because they thought they weren't for them. So I just think when you think about ethnic museums around this country, they've been doing, they were born out of community work. And so I think that's one of the biggest obstacle terms of everyone, all these people who are now doing community work thinking they've just discovered it. Um, good question about the 80s. I don't I, know what would I have, have a happened. theory. You have a theory about it's, the 80s? Yeah, tell me what you think about this. I don't know. Just thinking. So there was a period of time when the museum was focused on uh, we were supposed to be the incubator for creating the uh, National Museum of oh. African American History and Culture, right? So it was kind of like we were supposed to be bigger. We were supposed to create yeah. this opportunity, right? So it was like less about the community, maybe, and more about like getting National. big, scaling right. up. And interesting. You know, and then when that happened, it was, you know, the museum was like, okay, that's done. Now what? You know, who are we now? we're good, like what's there is an identity crisis so and like now we still have right Miriam like huge amount of collections dedicated to just African-American history and art and not necessarily social issues in DC which is what we're about now which is why you're doing this community collecting right yep filling gaps <laughs> filling kind of and and reflecting our current you know, community actually, like reflecting mm -hmm. the diversity in the DMV region where we are. What do you think about this theory, Melanie? That's really interesting. I never thought of it with the connection to um, African-American history and culture, even though that was in our name at one point, since that really, that didn't get authorized into the early 2000s. Um, but I think there was always this push and pull because if you think about it, we're arts, history, and culture. And so I always use the example of something like, um, let's do with Serena Williams. She could be in the Women's Museum. She could be in the African American Museum. She, like, there are a variety of different spaces. So how do you break up history, arts, and culture that way? And I think, in a way, that was forcing us to do that um, in the 80s. So I wonder if that was part of the reason. Um, but I, you know, I think it is just hard to figure out why you didn't really hear as much. And it could have been charismatic leadership. I mean, John Kennard was a legend. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, when leadership change happens and you don't have the same longevity, you don't have the same type of charisma, that makes a difference as well. Stacey, I just want to acknowledge that we're at the, at the one hour mark. Um, Stacy, did you want to bring us to some closure here? Um, yeah, so I think um, one of the things that I guess I've heard that's it's a thread and I don't know if the word has necessarily come up as much, but it's kind of it's that flip side of empathy, right, which is humility. And I feel like I'm wondering how, you know, with this idea that none of this is new, <laughs> right, and that getting outside of your museum and talking to like your neighbors should not be considered a radical act. Um, so how do we how do we start to build some humility kind of within the industry, not only in terms of our practice and in terms of like establishing that as like a, a cultural norm, right? 
but then also how do we start to instill that in our students and in the people that are coming up through these programs and you know who are coming into um museum education programs thinking that like they are going to absolutely like tear down the walls and they're going to change it and and then they stumble over the fact that they realize that there are articles from the 80s and the 90s and the aughts like giving literally talking about the exact same things that they're talking about and when they come face to face with that kind of inertia so i'm just kind of i don't know i'm curious like how do we how how do you all think that we start to bring humility into this conversation i think the way i think about it is don't worry about who's going to get the credit i think we're so tied into who's getting credit for what that that sometimes stymies us or prevents us from bringing our best ideas to the table so I think when we get away from that idea of who's gonna get the credit and just hunker down and do the work, you get the best product. Mm -hmm. On the flip side though, Melanie, there are folks who have taken ideas about community engagement as their own and we're not their own. So I don't know. There's I some, there's like some people, mix, especially people of color, right? Like who don't right. get the credit. I don't know. Right, no, I definitely agree, but I think it's important important because I think you start getting into this weird struggle when people don't want to work together because it's a credit issue. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say with that humility, if you're working at a community-based museum, your ultimate goal is to serve the community, not to get your next job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so are you doing work that's actually reflective of the community mm -hmm. versus building your resume? So I guess that's why I was thinking of don't worry about who's getting the credit. You know, are you doing the job that you signed up to do? Yeah. And can we solve the pipeline issue? Like, can we have more perspectives in the museum so that it's not so hard to think about other people's, you know, perspective? It's like, you know, and, and even in our own museum, we have, you know, the, we suffer from a little bit of like scholarly, you know, like we, right. we need to kind of like break up the scholarliness, you know, because scholars forget what it's like to not know something. You know, sometimes. And I think just briefly, and I know we're coming to a close, one of the things we didn't mention about John Kennard was he hired um, community organizers and social workers. Like that's who his staff was. There was no such thing as a museum. Well, he didn't hire museum professionals. He hired community people. Um, so I think that's another big difference in terms of the work. Um, and I know as we're looking to hire, we're in that same idea of how do we hire people from the community, not necessarily people that are steeped in museum culture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just took like, you know how all of you consultants know how hard it is to respond to a, an RFP or an RFQ. And we have to do this process for every single part-time contractor that we hire to do education or, or whatever. And so we try, I, the latest tech, tactic we're using is we've created a worksheet for people to just fill in the blanks of these proposals that you're supposed to do. And then we did like a call out meeting where we explained you know, how do you get into the SAM.gov system and how do you um, become a vendor and what does that mean and is it worth it? And we try to make it worth it, you know? Um, so I think there's a lot of kind of like barriers that you have to break in, in trying to get folks into federal um, positions, but we're trying to hack, this, hack it the best we can. Excellent. So, Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, I think there's one last Q and A question um, about um, about being struck in DC about the gentrification um, yeah. and specifically um, Southeast DC. Yeah. Um, and are there any plans to do an exhibition exhibition that focuses on that? So this is like a actually... bit of like the future planning side of it. right. We actually just took one down on gentrification in um, five DC neighborhoods. So a right to the city. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, an upcoming virtual exhibit um, or virtual experience, I guess I should call it, that Andrea is doing in Southwest will also look at some discussion around gentrification because I don't think you can talk about DC neighborhoods without talking about gentrification. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a constant thread and everything yeah. that we do. Um, yeah, there's a, a, a cell phone based like app thing that we're developing to show people the layers of neighborhoods through aug augmented reality mm -hmm. um, for neighborhoods that have changed dramatically over the years, or, like in the last like two years or like three years. 
um, people just don't know what used to be there at all and or what kind of cultures have been kind of extinguished. So Carolee, I've, en I've enabled your screen if you wanted to elaborate on your question. No, I, I don't want to elaborate, but I would like to say hi to Barbara <laughs> <laughs> and to Kathy. And I appreciate this forum so much. And I'm so glad to be a part of this um, uh, session. It was wonderful. Thank you for saying that. Thank you, Carolee. Thank you. Can I ask one more quick question? We're out of time. We're technically out of time, but there are still people hanging on, so go for well, it. Well, maybe I'll ask, ask the panelists, um, what would you like this incredible work that you've done through this pandemic, et cetera, be remembered for 20 years from now when a new staff comes in or staff come in and you look at the body of work that you did in this period, this critical period in our, in our global history and nation's history, by the way, too. In particular, you would like to be have it be remembered for that will inspire those folks to take their work to the next level and meet that moment in time. I would think I would want them to think that we took a chance and we tried new things and we figured it out um, and that it was okay. The museum, well, the museum closed, but you know what I mean? Everyone hates, they don't want to try something they knew because they think the world's going to fall apart. Well, the world did fall apart. We tried something new and it was fine. <laughs> I think I would want to be known for um, going beyond the walls of the museum at a time when being inside was unsafe. Um, it's, it's like once you, once you literally start thinking outside the box, um, you're brain just goes crazy with idea you know it's like oh we don't have this like shackle around you know uh like it, it felt like a shack because we couldn't invite people in we we couldn't ethically right there were museums doing everything they could to like scrub and uh to, you know do all the things right like we know it's not safe here and actually the longer you stay aka dwell time the more unsafe it is like it just didn't make any sense to keep on, right? So it's like it, it's like radical, radical acceptance of what is. Like this is this is the situation. So now what do you do? And letting go some way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think reaching out to community members, and I think the Take Time Thursday kind of says it all, <laughs> just like working with community members and you're reaching out, Andrea, to um, you know, high school, the, 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 the local high school on to create something for inmates, um, et cetera. Like, I think all of those kinds of um, just, yeah, really thinking about the needs of the community in a time of crisis. Yeah, general theme. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. Yeah, this has been great. It's just a start. I feel like we need to write a lot of, somebody get on that, <laughs> write some, some of this stuff down. <laughs> Were anybody taking notes? Can we just turn this into something? Well, we did just record it. it. We have a okay. nice little, you know, Q and A and chat transcript. So yeah, so it's a start for your next chapter. Thanks so much for the invite. Promise. Absolutely. Thanks so much. We appreciate right. it. Thank you. Look us up, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And look for look for another conversation from from this panel as we reach out to other people who are pushing the boundaries and lying on the on the outside of what the norm might be. So we're we're going to continue to develop this series. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.